Well, hello and welcome to this final session of the World Economic Forum uh, here in Delhi. It's been a really, really, I don't say this every time, a really good uh, last two days with people getting more practical and more nitty gritty and not just uh, ideas up in the end. You can see the amount of enthusiasm because of the absolutely full hall, there's a uh, standing room only. Thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, in this final session, we want to talk about what steps are needed by India for, for India to take off. What specific steps are needed? Uh, one thing we have all sat together and promised what we will not do, we will not make any statements which are motherhood and apple pie. Like, we're not going to say we need better infrastructure, we need better schools, we need better medicine, we need better people, we need better everything. That's like our Indian cricket commentators. The way you win a cricket match, they say, if you bat well, you bowl well, and you catch your catches, you're going to win this match. <laughs> now, we want to know how do you bat well, how do you bowl well, and how do you catch a catch? Um, so we're going to ask some tough questions, and I can see some people here can ask, make some tough questions and answers too. Uh, and uh, we couldn't have uh, better minds amongst us. We have Vijay, um, a most amazing personality who's been a rebel all his life. Uh, he's a dropout from classroom. He dropped out from his classroom to the computer room. Sorry, first row to last row to computer room. That's right. <laughs> and has been an entrepreneur and a disruptor all your life. God bless you. And of course, with Paytm now disrupting India and uh, the entire financial world. We have Amitabh Kant, who is, I would consider, most unlike any government officer that you normally meet. Absolutely. Thank God. <laughs> and um, most respected, I'd say. And. Uh, He's really responsible for pushing India's digital transformation, and he's really doing a fine job. But we'll find out exactly how. We have Geeta, who, uh, amongst all of us, is the most brilliant mind. Uh, I, was that saying not saying much? <laughs> um, I remember when we used to do the World This Week. Now that was a long time ago. People used to say. That is the best program on Doordarshan. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> is that saying? Is that a compliment? Anyway, those who were of that era before your time will remember what that means. She's a professor at Harvard, and she's not just a theoretician. She's practical, down to earth. In fact, she's even advising the Kerala government as we speak. Um, and of course, we have uh, Johan Orik. Am I pronouncing that right? It's pretty close. Roughly, yeah. yeah. So we have an academic, we have a government servant, we have a startup entrepreneur, and we have a man who combines all three. You couldn't get a better panel, right? Let's have a round of applause for this wonderful panel. <laughs> now, you know, it's tough to get anchors to shut up, but I'm going to just give you the format of the show today. We are not going to have questions only at the end because we're dividing this into five topics. And each, at the end of each topic, about 10 minutes, please ask your questions. At that, I'll, I'll ask you on that topic. Uh, and at the end, we'll have free for all for any question. But don't ask a different issue when we're discussing. Like our first topic is uh, protectionism. Should India protect its startups from foreign competition? Uh, we'll go into that in a bit of depth. And you've got top, uh, questions on that? Please raise your hand and we'll ask. Uh, you can fire it to anybody in the panel. The sep second topic is, will e-commerce destroy small industries, small retailers, and medium size? Is this an antagonistic relationship, or can they both help each other? Uh, the third topic we'll be discussing is, has the government got any role to play in this new digital transformation world? Or should they just stay out of it? Is that the best thing they can do? Or if they're going to stay in, what should they do? Uh, the fourth topic is about China, where we know they have a $280 billion Alibaba. They have $100 billion companies. Are they our friend in this whole process while we're growing? Or are they going to be an antagonistic 
competitive relationship. What do we do about China and similarly other parts of the world? And finally, and really to take off, any country needs just one thing. You need a, an ability to laugh at yourself. Do we Indians have an ability to laugh at ourselves? And we're going to ask each one of you to try and prove one area or tell us one area where we really need to laugh at ourselves. And there's actually quite a few areas where we can laugh at ourselves. So if you've got any in the audience where you can think of why <coughs> Indians, journalists can't laugh at themselves. Journalists are above all this, you know. <laughs> we can't laugh. We are very, we are very um, yeah. self-important. <laughs> okay, so let's dive into the first topic. And that is about protectionism. Uh, as I mentioned, China has $280 billion Alibaba, many other 50, 70, 80 billion, 100 billion dollar companies. And when any, when any foreigner, forget China, Amazon or anybody, Uber, all these come into India, they bring in a huge amount of money. They bring in funds. They're not necessarily bringing in technology. They're not bringing innovation. They're not bringing uh, new ideas. But m one thing they do bring in is money. And that's going to kill our, our industry, or is it not? Kita, protectionism or not? Um, so I guess I would disagree a little with you about the fact that they only are bringing in money and not bringing in technology. Some of this is kind of embedded in the people that come and work here, in who they hire and how they get trained. So there is transfer of uh, soft skills, if not you know, the hard skills. Right. Uh, I'm in general in favor of, and I suspect most people would be in favor of having a competitive environment, as long as the level, we have a level playing field. Right? Right. So as long as we agree that the access of Indian firms to finance uh, I don't think we lack for great innovators in, in India. Uh, if that is the case, uh, you know, I don't see a reason to have a very strong policy anti uh, uh, big companies coming in. At the same time, I actually do like very much the idea of tying up foreign direct investment with some kind of technology transfer too. Uh, you know, the Chinese model relied a lot on that. Uh, and, so and I does think the I can Chinese see model actually almost prevent foreign competition from coming in? That's how Alibaba grew. Uh, I mean, they just don't have foreigners coming in a little bit lately, but even those who came so late, they couldn't make any a dent. In it. No, they Uber had, selling out there. It, it, it dip, I mean, it varies. You're talking yeah. about the more recent industries, but China has been doing this for the yeah, last yeah, 25, yeah. 30 right, years. Right. And so initially, they were bringing in foreign companies that came in and were also, also transferring technology. Right. Uh, and so that's certainly, there's a space uh, for that to happen. But again, I would, my punchline would be, to create a level playing field, right. to make sure that, uh, because anything that's but, uh, done to prevent right. competition is a problem. Yeah. That's a point, because protectionism in the old days used to lead to monopolies and inefficiency in India, and we hate protectionism. Mm -hmm. But here, when you've got protectionism, you've got so many startups, they're not going to be monopolies, they're going to be, in fact, over competition. So do you feel level playing field doesn't quite exist because foreigners coming in have already become $150 billion companies, and they've got so much money, our startups cannot compete. Uh, Pranav, you need to look beyond just e-commerce. You know, it's, uh, the digital world actually transcends right. the boundaries of yes, e-commerce. Yes. Uh, actually, the kind of innovative things Indian startups are doing, in, you know, amazing things in the field of health. You look yes. at Concio Medical, you look at Practo, you look at uh, some of these new startups like Mitra Biotech. I mean, they've relocated from Stanford to India. So uh, the amazing amount of work, they're bringing in a different energy vitality into Indian uh, de growth and development. Yeah. Now, many of these startups require FDIs. You know, it's impossible to grow without a lot of uh, investments coming into them. I mean, look at even a uh, company like Paytm. I mean, Paytm has attracted investments because uh, you had a very dynamic entrepreneur in, like uh, Vijay here. And, uh, you know, the Chinese model was a very <coughs> closed model, but India's opened up in 1991, and since then it's it's just opened up, opened up, opened up, and we've, we've 
uh, we now believe against protectionism of any kind. So we need to allow an, uh, Indian entrepreneurship to grow. We need Indian young Indian entrepreneurs. But, uh, we, need, we need young entrepreneurs. Uh, to my like mind, me? we need young entrepreneurs to take on the Amazons of the world. And we need, to take, we need them to take on in Amazons of the world by sheer ability on technology and by the ability to understand the Indian uh, market scenario much better. Vijay, now Gita is one key factor, level playing field. But when a foreigner comes in, he's got everything else level, technology, skill sets, manager, we are great entrepreneurs. But then he's got $10 billion to lose, which our startups don't have. Now you're in a, both sides of the, so you would really understand which is better to keep, have a bit of protection like China or not. First of all, level playing field is a good word, but reality is that everybody is built with a construct which is not so straightforward to be identified that you have a level playing field. People have structures and the aging of the business and opportunity of access to the capital, which is totally different because you're structured in a way that you can access something else versus an Indian company can access and so on. I truly believe that opportunity for Indian entrepreneurs is to build a global company out of India and not give India as a market to a global company. Right. It is not just our duty or an obligation, but it is our right to build India as a market, even if it is an open market that exists today there. Because I do not believe that entrepreneurs do not have enough energies and capabilities to fight this managerial, if you will, the talent there. And I'm not treating that it is an entrepreneur versus manager gap, but I'm trying to say an entrepreneur can tweak around a business model with a lot more freedom than a manager would be able to do it if the market conditions change and that person has to have a buy-in at a headquarter back. So playing on the advantages of who you are and playing on the disadvantage of what your target is, is the business about it. And fundamentally here, if money is your answer to the problem, you've not found the answer to the problem yet. It is not about tens of billions of dollars. I don't think... But isn't that a little I, easier to say than I, done? I do not Everybody's think... Everybody's got same entrepreneurship, no, same technology, but somebody's got 10 billion. It is absolutely not. Masa Sun was not a family <coughs> that would have inherited SoftBank and built what it is today. Mm -hmm. In the label playing field in that country, and there are examples in this room, it would have not been possible in a way that, oh, no, I have the same access and same not or not. It is the energy and a passion that brings over and t take over the chasm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the uh, car makers, if you will. Japan created Toyota, Nissan, and uh, Honda, and talk about when they were lending in Japan, they were making this car. They were building cars for Japan in a market right. which was local. They were not building gas guzzlers like Americans were building or they were not making cars like the Germans were building. Right. They were building cars which were made for Japan. And when they had built and owned it, they went to the world market. And today we know what who sells more in US than who sells more right. uh, US company Let or a German company. Let me just actually bounce that off you, Johan. Uh, in our television sector, especially in the news sector, we didn't allow foreigners to have a majority. And they invested in many other companies, Indian companies, and Indian companies have grown, and uh, they've far outstripped BBC, CNN. I mean, uh, BBC and CNN used to be, or BBC used to be 70% of the market, now they're less than 7%. But Indian entrepreneurship and journalism has grown, some may say grown too fast and too far, but anyway, we'll come to that at another point. But they ha it has created a huge industry. Is that needed in... Uh, not just e-commerce, digital transformation where foreigners have to invest with Indians or can they come in independently? I first of all completely agree with the, what the previous people have said is that... But they all said uh, different things. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but the basic thing was the same yeah. that for innovation and, and for growth and particularly for startups it's not capital that's the short uh, resource it's brilliant people and brilliant business models to make that right. to, to make profit uh, with that. That is what is uh, what we have a shortage of. Uh, I love the saying anything that doesn't kill you make you stronger and I really believe in that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, you, you know what some of the most um, um, entrepreneurial areas are in the world is often the most difficult areas in the world uh, where there's no support from any government or even a government that opposes you. You would be amazed how many startups there are in Paris, arguably a government that makes life for companies very difficult. Uh, Africa, the same. Some of the most brilliant entrepreneurs come from, uh, from Africa. Look what happens in Kenya in the telecom sector. Um, and so it's not 
capital that's a shortage. It's it's really bright entrepreneurial uh, people, and but they capital helps a bright uh, entrepreneurial. Yeah, people. it happens at some point. I mean, if I'm but bright entrepreneur, I've got ten billion. There's more than enough capital around to the world, uh, particularly with the current interest rate environment. There is no shortage of capital. There's a shortage of bright people and good business models. And second of all, I would, say I would India, argue we've got too many bright people. We don't have capital. It's not easy to raise ten billion to get a startup and last three years against. Uh, a major American company that's in here. It's still an issue. And I remember uh, before you were born, I used to follow China very closely. And I went, I covered the first McDonald's that came to China. It was opened on a crossroads. On one side was the first McDonald's. On the other side was a huge poster of Deng Xiaoping with his arm like this, blessing McDonald's. That was a great symbol. It was a great piece to camera for a flunky journalist. But they did protect their industries for a long while. They got $80 billion a year in foreign investment. And everybody said every $20 billion in foreign investment, not in the stock market, investment is almost 1% on your growth rate. At that time, we were getting $3 billion. Uh, so they had $80 billion. Um, so they seem to have done everything right. Can we learn from them? Um. Well, they did many things right. <laughs> I wouldn't yes. say they did everything, everything right. Yeah. There are sectors that we're not discussing today that they didn't do great things about. Um, and also, the most recent uh, last five years in trying to prevent uh, their growth rates from coming down too much, they've been fueling it with credit. Credit, yeah. Uh, and that's a model we simply should not be uh, adopting, having a credit field. Uh, expansion. Everybody's talking about that being a bit of a bubble. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you look around, I think the fact that we've learned looking around the world is that whenever we've seen growth that's basically been fueled by credit, uh, it's usually been, you know, there's the, 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 the fact that there will be a crash has been kind of almost with certainty. Yeah. So we don't want that uh, in India. And so while we're talking about capital, I just want to make that very clear. There that This is not this. about suddenly opening up the taps Great. and making $10 billion Credit, dollars yeah, available to all, yeah. to all startups in India. Yeah. That's um, a good point. Yeah. So uh, what, what China is certainly, I mean, China did the, some of the things right, which is in terms of you know, how their own speci special style of ease of doing business, uh, which is getting things done uh, when right. people came in and they had to start companies and they needed uh, land and they needed uh, permits, those things were available. Yeah. Um, so you know, it, they also focused a lot on education, they focused a lot on in, in yeah. increasing human capital. So those are the kinds of things that are you know, lessons for, for India to, to take. Yeah. Uh, it's not specific, this is not science that's come out of China, I think that's the way best practices have been everywhere in the world. Right. And so it's quite clear what India needs to do. Yeah. When I was in the finance ministry many years ago, when you were also a bacha. Uh, we had a lot of protectionism and we were opening up. That was the time of opening up. And every industrialist used to come and I was just a joint secretary and these top industrialists would walk into my room as though I was king of, you spend a bit of time in government, you feel like you're God. They really treat you like that. And they'd all say one thing, I'm totally in favor of opening up the economy. But in my industry, there are specific conditions. This one you should not open. So it's great to hear you saying, open up. But are we kind of a reflex against a failed uh, policy of the past, which doesn't quite apply here, because that created crony capitalism and monopolies. Now, in digital transformation, all the examples you gave, no question of crony capitalism. These guys are entrepreneurs, and they're competing against each other. So is it a different world? Uh, Pranoy, you know, you just can't copy the Chinese model no, 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 to no, an no. Indian soil. You know, and last two years, we've opened up just about everything. Indianized, no, so like let me say socialism with the Chinese uh, context, in uh, whatever, China with the Indian context. Yeah, so India has to have its own growth model. And, yeah, you which know, is in, what? And India, last two years, if you mm. look at it, we've opened up defense, we've opened up railways, we've opened up construction, e-commerce, uh, we've opened up insurance, pension funds, we've grown, yeah. we've opened up everything. Our FDI has grown by 53% at a point of time, and globally it's declined by 16%. Right. We are the number one FDI recipient country in the world. We've beaten China at it. You, you can't suddenly backtrack. You'll be sending a very, very wrong message. Message. Now you want to say that I want to protect my uh, startups? I mean, you, you can't have a half-baked house. And since when have you become a great advocate of protectionism? <laughs> Me? Yeah. 
Look, I am an anchor, I have no views. <laughs> I agree with her, I agree with him and I agree with you. Anchors don't have views so, for God's so, sake. So my belief is, well, let me just ask everyone. Like so my, like my, my, I, I agree, it looked like that. I, I know, my, no. Maybe I, you want to uh, protect the newspapers. Uh, that might be <laughs> okay, how many of you here believe the startups in this new digital world need protectionism for five years? How many believe they do need protectionism? Zero percent. Or are you too ashamed to raise your hand? So, <laughs> what do you say when we're not in the room? <laughs> so, okay, so 100 percent believe there should be freedom of all types, even if it's not a level playing field? <laughs> Even if it's not a level playing field, okay. This is hardcore. That's a different... You know, so Pranam... Hardcore. Any startup here? Yeah. No? <laughs> In the audience, you got us. Okay. Are you worried? There's one behind. Oh, okay. Do we have a mic? And you can ask a question. I want to be very clear. I am not for protectionism. But I have to counter you <laughs> to make the best come out of you. And I don't... I'm, as I said... Anchor, no views, no ideas, no IQ. Uh, uh, Pranay, I... Pranay, I... Oh. <laughs> Pranay, we are actually uh, completely in, in the same belief as Vijay that out of India we can build well-beating stuff. You've got to find your niche. You've got to skate smartly. Got a question uh, for them? Anybody? Uh, yeah, here's a question. Come. I just have one question. Yeah. Of course, I mean... Bureaucracy, I mean, Amitabh, you, Pranav, uh, your background. Indian indigenous manufacturing capabilities was probably, you know, it became what it is today because you had licensed Raj in the past. So you could protect your industry to become capable before they could address the global markets. True or not? I don't know. I'm just saying that whatever you do, how do you make, make sure that you can insulate some, you know, some of these people to excel in what they do in some shape or form so they can actually compete in the world and not just e-commerce? You know, you've got to create the right ecosystem. I mean, what is it that has enabled 1,500 multinational corporations to relocate their global innovation centers to Bangalore and Hyderabad? I mean, they're innovating for the rest of the world based in India. You know, and Indians are innovating not only for themselves, but for the rest of the world. But we don't have a $280 billion company. Uh, Pranav, that'll happen. I mean, you just started liberalizing. Your liberalization started in 1991. China started two decades before. So your process of wealth creation has just happened. I mean, people like Vijay have just started creating uh, wealth now. I mean, he'll be a multi-billionaire in a decade's time. I mean, so just... <laughs> what do you mean? He already is. Government <laughs> Okay, let's move on to our next topic. Uh, and then we'll... Because uh, I've been shouted at that we're going over time. And that is about the competition or is it complementary between digital world and the bricks and mortar world? Say retail, for example, uh, small retailer and the e-commerce retailer. Is it, um, we know that in some senses, the digital world gives a small retailer an all India market. I, I remember uh, a startup gave me an example. His aunt used to sell saris. She used to go from shop to shop and beg them, Thoda waha pe rakhye, don't put it so low, let people see it, and they'd be treated like uh, uh, dirt by the shopkeeper. And she could hardly sell. Now she sells 17 crores a year of saris on uh, the various platforms. So the digital world has provided the small entrepreneur an all India market. So is it, Vijay, competition? Because the retailers, and they're a powerful lot in India as a lobby, are very worried. So how do you tell the retailer, don't worry, it's not, comp it's not competitive, it's complementary? I think, uh, I don't think that retailers in India are worried about technology-led companies because technology-led companies give them also that equal market. What they're worried about is exactly what you a while back were talking, that international companies come and throw money and that becomes a little sort of irrational playing field. Right. And in, in, in the offline retailer space, it looks like that offline, online, online does the that irrational exuberance of money in a way, which is what brings a conflict or tension. It is not about the technology can support them or not. Okay. I'm a, founda a fundamental believer and foundational believer that technology is an inevitable journey for 
anyone who does not have a technology play yet, even if it is part of efficiency or growth, whichever way you choose to do it. You will not live without it. You have to live with it and not live with it, but maximize your outcome with it. You're what saying it's inevitable. It's anyway. inevitable. It is just but that irrational spending by the online that gets right. challenged, I but think. Geeta, isn't the government worried about this, that the retailers will start protesting on the streets and therefore we have to protect them? I mean, we are a democracy and a, a anarchic democracy. And we love, our, we love that aspect of us. But they, is that a political worry? Again, to be clear, this is not a debate about big versus small, because this could be two small people, but doing, right. providing the same service differently. Yeah, so maybe you, the digital person or the digital company has lower costs or something, you know? Yeah, no, but I'm so just saying that, threat, yeah. I mean, previously when you had these discussions about, yeah, yeah. you know, these, uh, <coughs> these conflicts, it was about the big guy versus the small guy. Right. Now it's about, you know, if you look, took a look at Uber and Ola, it's mm. about the previous taxi driver versus the new p the person who's, right. you know, a small entrepreneur, a self-employed who decides to drive around a car. Right. So the question is, you know, who do you pick? Are you going to pick the, the small taxi driver? Or are you going to pick the small household now, is person? Is it a question of picking one or can you say both will flourish? You, I, don't think, I don't think governments can choose that and I don't think that they can there have any special knowledge or special advantage in figuring out that, okay, the way technology is going, we should be supporting this particular group of people and not these other group of but people. But the problem is they can influence it. For example, they say you can't have foreign investment if you're going to stock the no, products. You can't have a surge pricing. You can't have number of cars. Uh, today morning we got to know from yeah. the IPP secretary that a city in this country has a limit on number of cars. That sort of protects in a way, who's running it yeah. versus number of cabs which otherwise could have been created. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought we were talking about what they should do, not what they're doing, in terms of what's the right well, thing to do versus what I mean, what they can, doing. so should they not, or should they, what, should, should they do just, this uh, kind of protection? And just forget the, the fact that they're going to lose a lot of votes with the small guys? I, I, have, no, I have no political <laughs> I know, interest in, 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 in this matter. But I think what's, what is true, and this is not something to be ignored, which is the fact that it, it's no longer the case that one can say, I'm going to let a big constituency of people just suffer in the transition to a better world. So there is certainly a need for some stepping in, but it cannot be something that's irrevocable. You know, like what we did in the past in India, which was protect certain sectors for small scale industry. Those were like very, very hard to change because it, you know, it just doesn't uh, change very quickly. But you can think of short run things which somehow on their own lapse over time that might be okay. Okay. So intervene, but for us, a yeah, period of transition. Yeah, automatically have of. a lapse date. Is it a bit like, again, going back a bit, when computers came in, everybody said, don't let them in, our clerks are going to lose out, but they will come in. So are we, when we are kind of doing these uh, limits on the new technologies, is that just you know, barking, I mean, something against the wind, which is a tornado and is going to take over anyway. Uber and Ola or that model will take over and you're just delaying it. Uh, Pranoy, like let's, computers, uh, sorry. what's the size of our e-commerce? It's about 25 billion. Take it from me, by 2025, this is going to be 300 billion. Yeah. And this is going to happen because we're the only country with a billion uh, uh, mobile, but we'll be no, a billion that's smartphone. Fine. Is that, but let me come to that. that terrify the small no, retailer. No, so the that only figure. way, only way uh, you can, uh, you know, the small retailer must embrace technology. Right. The small retailer, uh, mm. he wants to do brick and mortar. Please do it. But embrace technology. You can do both brick and mortar and e-commerce. Right. But there's no way you can stop e-commerce. E-commerce is going to suck in every single handloom, handicraft, cottage industry. That will become the biggest driver of job creation. Are you sure you're a government officer? Because you're saying open up, <laughs> embrace technology. <laughs> Something's wrong here. <laughs> New generation, I must say. So do you see a conflict? You can be honest. <laughs> I, I'm paid to be honest, actually. <laughs> and I really think you're in the protectionist camp. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with, <laughs> with amazement. I'm, I'm following I am this a conversation. Autocratic. Uh, yeah, anchor. and no opinion either. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's clear. I really think it's, um, 
what has been said is, uh, is, is what I uh, firmly uh, believe. If you look at a player like, uh, let's go to a different country, not to India, which is maybe a bit less uh, sensitive. Let's go to Amazon. Uh, Amazon is one of the biggest creators through its platforms, through its e-commerce platform and its brick and mortar platform, by the way, uh, to enable retailers, small mom and pop shops to sell anything over their platform. It so is it gigantic. And not just a couple of dozen or so, hundreds and thousands. And it can be totally complementary. The example of Uber uh, was uh, was given. Uber it's about embracing. It's about embracing technology, and it's not only about e-commerce. Uh, it's about every ding, different uh, channel. Certainly, retailers need to use all of that. Right. So it's both. Okay. So let me ask everybody here: hands up for those who feel that the new technology <coughs> and the bricks and mortar are in direct competition. I think I'm in the, uh, I would just, uh, as a health warning, we're not in a typically Indian uh, audience. This is not a random sample here. Ah. You ask it, what is it? How many believe that they are complementary and they will, the, the small scale sector will benefit from the digital transformation? It's consistent. It's like, <laughs> I would say 90% say yes, so there are still 10% who don't know. Because zero put their hands up for competition. Okay, any questions on this particular issue? Yeah, there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, just take a mic. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kamal Hingorani from SpiceJet. Come from aviation and tourism. So uh, the aspect of online travel agents, seven, eight years back, the likes of Clear Trip, uh, Make My Trip and all, came in and there was a huge uh, hue and cry by the brick and mortar saying that they are taking away our business. Right. Uh, but the reality is like uh, Amitabh just mentioned that the small brick and mortar also had to embrace technology to a certain point and they still survived because they provide that personalized service which probably an online and OTA may not be able to. So maybe a similar uh, complementary thing would be possible for various industries. Any question you want to anybody? So, so my question is uh, to Vijay who talked of technology having taken over. Uh, so if we take the example of Ola where we are saying that Ola and Uber will probably completely overshadow the individual uh, uh, Kali Pili. Uh, do you think the same thing will happen to travel agents, the brick and mortar? The Kali Pili, you mean taxi, just to... Yeah. Um, my, my learning has been l that technology adds to the consumption. It doesn't, it, it's not a zero sum in a way. Because it is easily available and I can, I will consume more if the rest of the economy is growing. In a way, technology increases consumption of an economy because convenience and availability changes. Uh, we, we sometime later will become impulse buyers of things which we might have not even thought that we would buy because it is easily accessible in a way. And that stands for that even if you were to have online massive number of people to sell uh, digital travel plans, Ultimately, overall travel will grow and people will find their own niche and spaced out opportunities. By the way, we had a bigger question uh, a while back when Mr. Mittal and uh, other team were sitting here that technology Are eventually... You, you had a better anchor then? <laughs> <laughs> the question was a really important which just leads to this. Huh. Technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on is getting so efficient that higher strata jobs, jobs where a uh, doctor was operating and a robot arm was operating, and trading floors where uh, bankers or security uh, traders were trading versus a robot bot was trading, and these are fabulously, fantabulously ahead of human thought processes. So effectively, while the efficiency will come and people will get jobs, they, people will get to do a few more things. The bigger challenge of this technology will be, or maybe, and that is a question that was being debated, I think where we should go is, are these technologies challenging a job itself while efficiency is coming? Would you say uh, it challenges jobs in the short run, but in the long run, like computers, it creates jobs? I don't think anybody can answer that question right now. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty about the, the kind of, I mean, every time there's been the so-called industrial revolution, that's always been the billion the question. dollar question about are we basically uh, uh, substituting m labor with, uh, with machines? And the question has come up now too, and like uh, Vijay said, it's, a, it's on a grander scale, because previously it used to be Smaller that skills. the very yeah. high skilled jobs yeah. 
uh, would not be replaced. And, but that's come up too. Except for the clocks in Calcutta, when the computers <laughs> came in. That was a real worry for them. But do you think um, it's a short-term problem and the, anyway uh, technology is going to take over and it will create more jobs? So, uh, uh, Pranam, my belief is that uh, this industrial uh, manufacturing revolution, smart manufacturing revolution, or, is is inevitable. It's the digital inevitable. technology is going to converge with so the process of manufacturing, shop, right. and what the consumer decides will get translated at the floor shop, and uh, manufacturing will become extremely fashionable, and it's not going to be dirty, dark, and dangerous anymore. Mm -hmm. It'll be very fashionable and sexy in future, and therefore, you know, you have to be ready for that, and uh, you have, you know, you it's going to it may lead to some loss of jobs initially of a particular kind, but it'll create jobs of a different kind. It'll create high value jobs. And what your skilling should really do is to train your people to get jobs which will give you higher unit value realization. Okay, that brings us to our third segment, which is in this whole transition, and I, I sh this is for you, has government got any role to play or is the best thing you can do is just stay out? No, the government must act as a very uh, active facilitator it must act as a very active catalyst uh, and uh, as a very active uh, driver of change. It so must they must behave like they've never done before. Absolutely. It must keep itself hands off, but it should encourage the private sector to embrace smart technology from all over. But can uh, they do that? I can tell you something. Uh, we said, okay, Doordarshan is there. Politicians must not, must give it independence. You know what they did one night? They phoned up the DG and said, I'm having a party. Please show that clip of a dance with Madhuri Dikshit in it for my party. That's the level of interference. They had to show it on Doordarshan. The whole country had to watch something because he has a party going on. Can our politicians keep their hands off? Uh, you know, Pranav, I think the days <coughs> of... Uh, the days of Madhuri Dixit are over. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> well, you belong to a different generation. <laughs> you know, in Don't my rub that in. Well, <laughs> I, You know, there's a generation gap, I think. You know? <laughs> okay, so you say put on uh, Deepika Padukone. <laughs> but you, politicians of every generation are the same, no. they interfere. Well, I, I, I think uh, it's important to understand that uh, the government has to spearhead change, and it's doing that in many, many ways. And, and it's important to understand that uh, this new uh, revolution of manufacturing is, is going to spread in a very big way. I mean, look at what's happening in universal uh, payment interface that is going to happen. You're going to make every single debit card, credit card, ATMs, posh machines, all of them will become redundant in India. India has the possibility of becoming the first cashless, paperless, presenceless society in India. Simply use biometric and your mobile telephony. Every individual will become a walking mm. ATM by 20. 25. It's possible for India to do this. Right. You just need to create the right ecosystem, and that's what government is doing right now. Right. And you know, you have the advantage. Okay, let me ask a question. How many of you believe the government can keep their hands off and not interfere, or in fact, unbiasedly encourage? How many feel you, they will stay away? God, you won't believe. How many feel they won't stay away? <laughs> that's about 40%. So 50-50? One second, you need a mic. <coughs> While it is agreed that government should keep off, and <coughs> Amitabh is a probably an example that a change is happening. But I don't think the same, similar change is happening in the political side. Ah, that's interesting. Which is a very important part of the government. Vijay? One thing is, if we had a whole lot of Amitabh Khan's things would be different, but there's politics and the politicians can't keep their hands off. Uh, very well put, actually. I think we should remember that uh, people like Amitabh and his department are must requirement. There are kind of situations that we wouldn't know where to go and there is a direction and there is a champion of that cause in a larger environment. Right. Typically, whenever there have been a question in a government or policy making, the choices have been given versus incumbent versus noobs, mm. noobs have been thrown out. So it is, I, I believe this is like 
early stage companies are on the shoulders of giants like this department which is championing them well right, i pranav right. i wanted to tell you but this i must say just uh, before you say that yeah it is a slight compliment to politicians that they allow amitabh to function yes right? that is true, that is true. no right? i think i think this department I mean, the old days he no, no. uh you know i want to put uh, this uh, i want to put this record right mm. because uh, you function in, in spite no, of no no uh, i want to <laughs> no no i want to tell you this that aadhar was started in the previous government's time yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the, we're not talking about any. No, no, yeah, and, and just, well, oh, I yeah. want to say this: that mm -hmm. this government, uh, you know, pushed it to its limit. Right. Every single government scheme, uh, right. they've they brought in efficiency using Aadhaar. Thirty-six thousand crores have been saved, and that's mm -hmm. happening right from the top because the PM himself is a techie. You know, so it's it's being driven right from the top. To say that every time government interferes, you're sadly mistaken. Mm -hmm. Here, the drive for in inclusion. I'm not saying. I'm just asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, Geeta. In Kerala, are you going to ask the government to keep their hands off? <laughs> I have nothing to say about that. No. <laughs> But can the governments keep their hands off? Uh, uh, it's, Or politicians? It's, I should make a distinction yeah, between technocrats yes. and politicians. Uh, well, I, I don't. It's it's difficult because politicians work uh, on election cycles, and they care about getting the votes, and. Uh, you know that usually involves at some point that they have to make uh, decisions that are not the best economic decisions but they have to do it so i don't think that they can keep their hands off fully in germany they don't keep their hands off at all do they what, well why, recently why do you, why in particular you ask me about germany <laughs> well because you know we just want an international oh yeah right okay stella example because i'm not german in case okay. you <laughs> no no but you were talking okay. about germany earlier oh right well um I'm a consultant, and I tend to uh, look at facts and draw conclusions from that. So uh, I'm not in your opinion an business. And uh, <laughs> and if you look at the the companies around the world that score the highest on the competitive scores, mm -hmm. and uh, just the WEF uh, brought out the latest score. And by the way, India made a huge jump, which yes. you should be very proud of. Yes. The ones that are consistently at the top ten <clears throat> for the last 20, 30, 40 years usually have highly capable, consistent leadership uh, in place. Uh, consistent and highly capable. Those two have a, uh, a government that focuses on the key enablers, like education, like infrastructure, like uh, yeah, like you name it. And third of all, allow the free economy to develop uh, and allow diversity and entrepreneurialism uh, to take its place. And also, those that fail allows <coughs> them to fail, and that's very very important. Right. Failure is a key uh, in success. Yeah, true. That doesn't happen in our public sector, but we'll come to our public sector. Uh, Any questions on this um, to the panel? You've got a question? Yeah, just step forward a bit so we can be dark right. there. Uh, just to make one specific point on the government involvement, um, especially when the market uh, has evolved and private sector has jumped in, government should not interfere. And I would go to the extent of traditionally what have been government areas: education, health, water. There are enough private enterprises now delivering solutions to these problems. government should create a framework where they allow these private enterprises to compete we have seen the reverse in recent past question that was a comment actually okay fine Sorry. any questions just let's have questions actually <clears throat> you have the uh, take a mic please so the local <clears throat> government which administrates the local offices or local facilities of a plant or uh, in a perfect world should facilitate all that that's a huge hurdle in india at the policy level fdi small retailer multi brand retailer all that is fine but that's a rule uh, what, uh, but what you are you are thinking of government is not just amitabh kant or central government right. operationally but what he has started yeah. which actually i think the world bank has taken on as well is ranking each state so as you you're dead right no, i mean ranking, reality is state wise take you inspection no, no, doesn't improve the quality measure. why don't you explain <laughs> what well, you know i i've uh, we did uh, Uh, on hundred points, we ranked the states last year. We said we'll name and shame the states and put it in public domain, and there was huge amount of competition. This year, we've done it on three forty-four points, and every single state is competing. I mean, this kind of competition among states I've never seen before, and the amount of dismantling of rules, regulation, procedures, acts that has taken place in India, I've never seen this happening before. So and you know, many states are accountability. Act, yeah, absolutely. Many states are determined to make themselves. Uh, the easiest and the simplest place it will take time you know 68 years of legacy don't expect it to radically change overnight mindsets are changing it will require a lot of more drive right. but i'm quite sure in 3 to 4 years time you'll be there okay 
I, I feel like I should counterbalance uh, <laughs> Amitai. Okay, so gango. I, I agree with the point that was made, that it does come down to uh, what happens on the ground. And, uh, you know, even now when I go to one of the state banks uh, to get some work done, it feels exactly like it was uh, 25 years ago. I mean, it's, it's the ground reality is it will take time. I don't, yeah. I don't think three, four years will be enough, but it will take you know, time. But it is still torture. The only problem is that Gita's understanding of India's ground reality is based from Harvard. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, that's, that's, that's an unfair cheap one. Shot. Because I'm afraid all of us have exactly that experience. You go to a bank, you probably haven't been to a bank yeah, in 30 years. Okay, let's move on to the next one. In this whole development, whether it's 5 years, 20 years, 30 years, uh, China, is he a friend? Or is it an antagonistic, a competitor? And we better watch out, man. China is there. What do you say? Um, there are two ways to look at it. And One, uh, first, give your disclaimer. Oh, I, I, I don't eat 40% Chinese for lunch. <laughs> but I have 40% ownership by a Chinese firm okay. in my company. <laughs> um, first of all, when it comes to India's sovereignty and choices we make for the borders, there is no doubt about it. There is a one way to look at it and there is no alternate way to look at it, which is that we will only be friends with those who are friends with our borders. That's it. So that is like the point number one to make when I talk about business. Safe borders create safe businesses. And when it comes to the business, it is nice to have money, but at a condition and a document that is written by us, not by, by us. With our terms and conditions. Yes. Right. So you've got to be like Trump, a good negotiator. Like <laughs> Trump is a bad example. <laughs> <but> <laughs> or claims to be. Uh, Gita, China, we should worry about it or embrace it? Oh, it? It doesn't matter what you think. You can't, you know, if you can't live with them, you can't live without them either. So, you know, this is a this, very safe answer. That is, that is, uh, you know, it is what it is. There is, uh, you know, China is... No, you can what? put up. He can put up hurdles and delay things. Yeah, no, no, or should he's, he? He's great. He's, he's opening everything up. So I'm not worried <laughs> about that. Um, or should he? No, I mean, uh, what we certainly need to make sure is that we have uh, good market access in in China because that's a big. That's market. his point about the other way around. Our terms and conditions. Exactly. Well. So uh, make sure that if that's the case, I think that's a big plus for the Indian economy to be able to have right. market access. Uh, you know, you you. You, you have to work with China in the, in the world markets. So uh, em don't embrace or reject, but you have to work together. Do both. Yeah, okay. and, and, it, and it could be a big plus. If, if we can get good market access, that would be a big plus. Are Europeans scared of China? Not in the least. <laughs> States don't have friends, first of all. They have interests, uh, I, would, I would suppose. <coughs> Second of all, imitation is never a good strategy. I've learned that over the years. India is not... China and the other way around. You're completely different. It takes different things for India to win. And so don't, don't look at that. And finally, if I may add, I've been coming to India for now a, a lot, many, many years. It's about time you guys stop being obsessed about it. China. I mean, just stop I talking about, obsessed it. about another it. Is, country. it is, well, it, it's, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be. I mean, it is not that interesting for okay. India. I think, actually, I think India is less obsessed about China than the Americans are about China. That is probably true as well. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with that. But still, it, it always surprises me. Hindi, yeah. Chini, bhai bhai? Well, you know, uh, Pranoy, in um, trade investment and also travel and tourism, hmm. uh, you know, there's no friend or foe. And uh, for long, uh, we've, uh, we have a huge fiscal deficit, you know, in about 76 billion of trade, there's huge fiscal deficit which India has. And uh, actually, uh, we've been just importing made in China, but the strategy should be uh, that invested by China and made in India. And we should get Chinese <coughs> companies to make in India rather than importing their goods. But the other so point is... we should is, stop importing their goods? No, we should import, but we should get the do Chinese both. companies to do manufacturing here. They've already created large capacities. Get, get them to do manufacturing in yeah. India. But the second key thing is Chinese will be the biggest travelers across the world. Yeah. And you need a law... You, know, you want travel and tourism will be the biggest job creator. You want jobs to be created in India, get Chinese tourists to come into India. In yeah, a big Johan way. speaks yeah. Mandarin already. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. A lot of people are learning Mandarin because they are... Uh, you need Chinese speaking guides. Right. How many believe that in this, uh, 
short-term future ahead for India, we should embrace China? And how many feel we they're going to be a major competitor and we better watch out? So how many people feel we better watch out about China? That's about 20%. How many feels embrace China? That's about 20%. So 60% remain undecided or refuse to reveal their preference. Or neither. Yeah. Third, element. Third element. Just a mic here, please. What should we learn from China? Should we learn from China? Yeah, yeah. Is there anything where we can learn from China? Right. Do the, like China how did, did... How did they make their industry efficient? Socialism under Chinese conditions, so China under Indian conditions. No, no, what if, if, under <laughs> that, if under the socialism... Any questions? One question here. Yeah. Oh, you already asked one. No, we need somebody who hasn't asked there. My question is to Geeta. Um, do you think India is on the right path for achieving growth with equity? And what, what's going well? What could be done differently? Okay, so is this, is this, this the... This is the is general this, question part, the, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. you start motherhood and pie. Is this the motherhood and pie question? Okay. Yeah, that's a bit. <laughs> uh, no, I think this is a... It, it, it's, a, it's, a it's a very good question, and obviously, uh, among the things that need to be done is you have to make sure that people have the right amount of skills, right skills in, uh, in uh, you know, being ready for the jobs that are going to come up. We need more job creation in India. The skill is a big, still is a big skill deficit. You say that's the key factor. I think that's a very important factor. It should come not only from the government, but should also come from enterprise. Yes. It should come right. from the private sector. Right, right. Uh, any other general? Uh, we're coming to the last segment where we're going to find out from the panel and from each one of you why we need to laugh at ourselves. And uh, I think. I know somebody will tell us many reasons why we should laugh at ourselves. So be ready, we are coming to you. Uh, any general questions which are not motherhood and apple pie? Ah, yeah, one more. I think I am the only old-fashioned retailer in the room. I am a grocer, I am a shopkeeper, so I think I must be, you know, I just need to comment on something that we have already discussed. <laughs> Um, first of all, we are not certainly terrified about the technology coming. And I, I like to believe that it's only a temporary disruption. Technology is a great leveler. And you know, we all, already we are embracing a lot of this technology at B2B level. Are you embracing it? We are already there. Yeah. Yes, very much. You have an e-commerce kind of We do have an e-commerce at B2B level that B2B. is making a lot of transfer. You know, and then, of course, at e-commerce level. Okay. Do you have a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to say that we are not terrified, certainly. We are willing and we are ready to take on technology and other things. And the old level playing field can be very terrifying for a lot of people like us now. Because then we are again talking about old protectionism. My point is that, you know, technology can be a leveler and tomorrow bespoke manufacturing. But you know, isn't uh, yeah. retail currently benefiting from a lot of protectionism <laughs> right now as we I speak? Think, I think it should go. And then we don't know bespoke... Multi-brand yeah. retail should come in? I'm already here as a multi-brand multi, multi brand retailer and we are don't doing... Don't say it publicly. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we as a local company, we are going... You know, we have went internationally and gave competition okay. to people. Okay. Other for things you. like for technologies you. like... Driverless cars, you know, driverless deliveries, drones, bespoke manufacturing. It could always be advantages to traditional retailers. So costs. let us don't write obituary to bricks and you know, mortar. And Perfect. I think it's still going to be there very much. Good lesson to Thank learn. Thank you. One more question there, and then we'll go on to why we should laugh at ourselves. There's this question about protectionism. And do you think India can progress without it's farmers, and you think farmers can survive without protection? This is a question Good to you, question. Good and question. this is a question to the government. Because can lot, farmers survive lot of without the protection? West has huge protection for their yes. farmers. So can we su can we survive that? Can we do we need it as well? Uh, you're right that there is a lot of uh, protection in the West for for farming. Uh, it's a difficult. It's a difficult question. I mean, the question is when you look at it from a global perspective, is that a good thing? Then that's definitely not a good thing oh, to okay. have protectionism anywhere. But one could argue from an individual country's perspective that that might be a good thing. Or could you but argue more, as long as they have it, we should have it? Or? No, I think the more important question is, again, let's care about the outcome. We want to have higher productivity in farming in India. We want that whoever is in the farming sector gets paid Gets earns a good livelihood. And there are many ways to solve that which 
at this point don't involve going for protectionism. I mean, you just have, you have to fix the problems with making sure that irrigation, making sure, you know, what, what gets used, and uh, you need to make sure that the produce that gets, uh, that these farmers make, reach the market, that they're not, there's no monopoly along the way that's right. taking away, uh, so you know, their rents. Those are more important areas to focus those on. Those are, those are, I would say, get those things right before we start talking about uh, protectionism. I have a question to ma'am here. Uh, I, I have Did a you call me ma'am? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor. That's good. Why are you asking that? I said I have a question for you. That <laughs> I have a belief that those who have always choose the rules to decide how will be played, and Western world and developed world more or less have more or less large number of uh, vertical of industries where they are like open up the world because we want to come there, and when they do not have in farming, they say let's protect it. Isn't it like that? I would agree with you to some extent that it's certainly the case that uh, you know there are two rules. I mean, when they go to the rest of the world, there is the rule that you have to open up, and when it comes to their own sectors, they have it. And and that's something that uh, the emerging markets should fight back on. I think that they should have a bigger representation in terms of decision making at the IMF, at the World Bank, and all of these organizations. This is for judge. Time we oh, you're looking around the corner. <laughs> Hoping your son would be able to answer this question. Oh, I think no, I want yeah. you to tell us why we need to laugh at ourselves and I what's funny about minute, us. But first, this uh, debate. Yes. Uh, not only till the West, especially the US, Japan, and France. UK is okay, Germany is not that bad. She <laughs> would know better. Not only till they are protecting, protecting for production, protecting for export, protecting for imports. We should protect our agriculture, and I'll come to what she said, well beyond they stop theirs, and I don't know when they will stop theirs. This is just one-sided nonsense. They don't listen to us when we negotiate last 30 years, whether it was GATT or WTO, he should know it better than me. It's very easy to say liberalize, liberalize. It's all right for industry. Politically, it's impossible, 60% of the population. She said more productivity, yes. America, 3% of their population produces tremendous amount of food. We have over 50, if not 60% doing that. To come to 3%, in your lifetime, we won't come to 30%. And that would mean 400 million being replaced in relation to the 10 million needing jobs now. No manufacturer will provide that. Forget the service industry. It's just not on. We don't want to kill our farmers. We don't want to kill India. So That's wait till they do it, then only think about no, it. No, wait yeah. till and it suits do us. It. They do exactly what suits them. Yeah. I've been involved in WTO negotiation, not maybe as much as him. In various committees, okay. I was on the expert committee of WTO when uh, Super Chai was the ch uh, WTO director general, uh, one of the 13 people. Okay, now you've got so serious. Chai. There's no, an ideal time China. to switch. I'll come a little bit on China. Quick joke. Uh, Tell us a good the Chinese joke. Chinese yeah. thing. Chinese question. Chinese on question. economic <laughs> matters, okay. let's get the best out of them. But till now, they've been negotiating harder than us. So maybe it's on equal terms or whatever. Now you're sounding like Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Bad that's, negotiation, that's, that's our SOB? problem. <laughs> but I trust, relatively speaking, Hillary, which people in America don't. And if he wins, <laughs> it will be because she could not get votes, yes. not because he got votes. But that's okay. another story. That's another story, yeah. Politically, and in every other respect apart from the economy, if I was the government, I will not show my hand. But I don't trust them, I don't like them, I'm very sorry to say this. Across the border, they keep humiliating me, not only 62 when we were stupid. Okay, got it. Et cetera, et cetera. Now you have you to laugh it. at yourself. Aren't you laughing at what <laughs> I said? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't people laughed at Bombay Club? <laughs> oh, yes, One member that's club? True. No, but more seriously, I think. Uh, not more seriously, there are less those seriously. Those who laugh, two things. One, a country serious. has to laugh as it's very serious, no, very serious. We, we are God-loving, God-fearing, we believe in fate. Mm. So many people have said, if this doesn't happen, if it's not inclusive growth, there'll be blood, rivers of blood flowing. No rivers of blood have flown 70 years, though billionaires have increased, what have also improved. But the inequalities have risen like mad. One of the weaknesses right. of globalization, clear-cut weaknesses, everybody accepts, Brexit accepts, Trump accepts, Bernie Sanders accepted. Right. So. Uh, 
Where's the we punch? laugh because of, with all the poverty here, if we have to laugh, no, there's so one, one, one thing, wrong with us, there's an act of fate. It is certainly true that, uh, you may not agree with this, but if you go to South America or most of Africa, the crime rates are way higher than India. I agree. Your houses are protected well, Venezuela in India. And Argentina. I know there's a lot of crime, but it's nowhere near as What happened in days. Colombia, Pranoy? No, I was going to just got the Nobel Peace Prize. The Colombian yeah. president. Wonderful today, news. Declared. Wonderful news. And for fighting that great, uh, signing that yeah. great agreement, yeah. which after that you had a referendum. referendum. And lost. One thing in India is safe, we've never had a referendum. Uri I think Uri it's okay. Okay, the let's... Other, uh, let's minute. The other reason no, we laugh is... The other way. Is you have to be ready to counter his extremely serious no, countenance today. You're so one last point. When you're not the in the room, you're very... You joke a lot. What happened now? One laughing point, laughing point. No, I don't speak. I don't... You ask me that. I never ask a question. I never make a comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. When the glass... Is half full. Oh, of what? Partly water. 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 You would say scotch, but that's all right. <laughs> Murat will say vodka, but that's all right. <laughs> he's, a, he's a friend of Erdogan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, partly to please, depending on the subject, hmm. please the powers that be. Hmm. Very fashionable. Everything is good, good, good. So you have to laugh. You see the glass half full. A few like me. Of course, that's good. Glasses are full. Of course, so what? Where were we? With the Southeast Asian and Chinese countries in 69. Where are we now? So I you're saying... The, I see the glass half full, so I don't laugh. The first machine is fine. The politicians don't like me. <laughs> of that. Because that is only, a very... That is a very... only idiotic industry. The day they start mind. liking you, I'll be very worried. Very worried. It's, a, it's a compliment. It's a compliment. I think... Um, um, so the laughable matter for us, all of us Indian, is that our, our aspirations are moon landing and global superpowers, right. and our appreciation is Jugaad. Jugaad. That's a great <laughs> thing about India. True, this true. Is, this is the real country. We applaud Jugaad like in nothing, and yeah. we still want to be the superpowers. Yeah. Jugaad is a, is a uniquely brilliant Indian phenomenon. So Why should it, we laugh? What should we laugh for ourselves so, about? So, you know, Pranav, I've worked in both uh, North Block and South Block. And between the two of them, we just about managed to block everything. <laughs> wow. So, we should change the names. The East Kun Block, the West Kun Block, the North Super. Block, and South Block. Now, you have to tell a joke about Indians. No, no, oh, no. I'm, 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 I'm a guest. I'm a guest here. And, uh, guests have to behave. No, and, no, um, we are embracing you. You can say oh, whatever yeah, you like. Right. We are not yeah. Indians are not sensitive. No, 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 not, not, not in the, not in the least. Not in the least. Not, not in the least. It's sort of like German humor, isn't it? <laughs> no, um, uh, no. I, I don't have a, a joke for you. I have to disappoint you. I can only share with you that this is an absolutely wonderful country, and uh, I oh. meet many India, uh, Indians that indeed the, the glasses have full. Uh, particularly a couple of years here? ago, oh, I, I come three times a year here and it's a already for country. a long time, and uh, and I still love it very much. Isn't it amazing? And I've learned to love it every time even more. And despite the fact that I have to crawl through the streets of Bombay sometimes um, in the late afternoon with all the people honking and et cetera, I still love it very much. Because what's so great about this place is the, 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 the sense of being alive. I know no other place in the world uh, where there's so much joie de vivre, the French call it. I wouldn't know exactly how to translate. That love for true. life. That is true. Um, and that well, is truly great here. Well, you're certainly not being seditious. How about you? Don't be uh, seditious now. <laughs> now, I, I'm actually, I'm going to say something that, that, I, that is not a laughing matter, oh. which is, um, you know, we've been talking about growth and we're talking about India two decades from now. I think, I just want to say that India has to be a better place for women. Right. Uh, right. Thank you. For, yeah. Yeah. for the, if you, want, if, you, if you want women to be a big part of the growth story for India, it has to be safe to go to work anywhere. Right. Uh, it has to be, you know, it's just, it's just very, uh, it's very important that, you know, it's not just the people living in urban India, but even women living yeah. in rural parts 
that they have a really a better opportunity than, and right. safer lives than what and they I'm have. And I'm not just now. saying this because you're here, and I've said this before, Indian women are far superior to Indian men. That's why 70% of NDTV is women. Far superior. They just need the opportunity and forget 9-10% growth rate, we'll hit 15%. Why do they tolerate us? I really don't know exactly. Good question. But thank you all very much for blocking everything and unblocking. Now we'll call it North Unblock and North and South Unblock. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Uh, thank you. One second, just one second. Philip, the managing director of uh, WEF, will come and uh, thank so, everybody. But it's yes. been a wonderful two days. God bless you all. Thank you. First, thank you, Prando, for an excellent and very dynamic and very lively moderation. You're a real great anchorman. Coming later. Yeah. So, <laughs> second, I would like to thank all of you for two days hard working, deep engagement, fighting in and for India. And I know that you cannot applause yourself, so please a big hand to our this year's co-chairs. Gita, Johan, Amit, BJ, and Anil and John who cannot be here. Thank you very much. And, a, and applause to uh, World Economic Forum. God bless you. And? Wonderful. So this is at the same time our appeal to you that you will be our ambassador for the next 12 months and make sure that everything what was discussed committed and agreed to, will be turned into reality by all of us. Yeah. Great. And finally, I would like to thank all the helping hands here. All our forums teams, our partners, Confederation of Indian Industries, under the leadership of our regional director, Viraj Mehta for South Asia. Viraj, come here to... Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.